I don't normally have anybody stand for me, either at the beginning or the ending of my sermon, so this was nice. I asked him why, and he said, it's because they consider you a missionary. I considered myself a missionary. I'm from New Mexico, a pastor in Wisconsin, ended up as a professor in Missouri, and now I'm in Massachusetts. Every year, George Barna does a study of the least religious states in order. Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut. Least religious states out of the 50. And I'm in the middle of all that. So I'm a missionary. And if you are a missionary sent by God to New England, one of the bluest states in the Union, Massachusetts, what would you do on Thanksgiving? My wife and I went to Plymouth, Plymouth Plantation, and we had Thanksgiving with the pilgrims. And then we went to the Mayflower, went to Plymouth Rock, and then I found something that's a hidden gem. Nobody goes to it anymore. It's neglected. It's known as the National Monument. Stands 81 feet tall. Atop that monument is a figure known as Faith, 31 feet tall, holding a Bible in her hands, she stands atop this monument facing the Plymouth Bay. And on four buttresses around the base of that massive monument are individuals designated carved in stone. Morality, and each side of morality is the prophet and the evangelist. If you go around to the other side, there's law. And on each side of that, there is justice and mercy. On the other side, there's education with two characters, wisdom and youth. And on the other side is liberty, which is a seated warrior with a sword in one hand and a broken chain in the other hand, depicting on each side peace and tyranny. And the monument was erected to remind us of the principles upon which this nation was founded because the people who erected the monument said, we are prone to forget, we need to remember why people came to this land, the first English settlers coming to this land for purposes of religious freedom. On the 4th of July this year, I went to Cape Cod, went to Provincetown, and went to the Pilgrim Monument. And I want you to know I'm proud to say I climbed all 240-some-odd feet of this monument so I could stand atop of it so I could tell crowds like you that I climbed 240 feet and would get a standing applause, but that obviously you're not going to do that, so... But just duly, be duly impressed, okay? Because that's quite a feat to climb that. That monument was erected to remind us of why these people came to this land. To remind us of the, why the pilgrims signed the document on the, what we know as the Mayflower Compact. Reminding people in print, no one, no one, no one is above the law. If we're ever going to get along, we have to make ourselves subservient to just laws. No matter how wealthy or how prominent you are, you must be subservient to law or everything unravels. The fabric of society falls apart. It's an amazing thing to live in New England and to see the religious heritage that we have behind us. One of the first things the Puritans did in Cambridge, Massachusetts was establish a school for the purposes of training ministers and missionaries. And Puritans were not known to be a real creative bunch, so they named this new college, established for training ministers and missionaries, New College. And that was its name, until one of the early participants in New College died and left his library of 400 volumes and half of his estate to the college, and it became known as Harvard. College, now Harvard University. If you were to look at the logo of Harvard, you will find in Latin the word veritas, truth, and it's inscribed over three books. If you look at the top two books, and it's a little hard to see on this slide, and don't look at the right, right uh, logo, that's the new logo for Harvard. But in the old logo, and it's carved in stone all over the campus, so even if you're embarrassed by your logo, it will haunt you if you carve it in stone. And indeed, this logo is carved all over the Harvard University campus. Three books. The top two books are open, face up. 
The third book is open, but face down. Veritas. What they were trying to communicate was this. Having done all the research, having done all of your study, having been the finest scholar you can possibly be, you will never fully arrive at truth until you turn to Almighty God for divine revelation. Research will only carry you so far. Study will only carry you so far. You need divine revelation. So sometime you have to lay the book down and seek the face of God to obtain truth. But also carved in stone around it are the words, Christos et Ecclesias. Truth for Christ and the church. One of the first schools, the first school started for training ministers and missionaries to elevate people, to equip them to be able to proclaim truth for Christ and the church. One of the early fellows of Harvard University pastored a church on the frontier. Nobody normally thinks of Massachusetts as being the frontier, but at that day and time, the frontier would have been Northampton, Massachusetts, kind of the western side of Massachusetts. That man's name, who was a fellow of Harvard University, was Solomon Stoddard. Solomon pastored this church for 60 years. Imagine that, pastoring the same church for 60 years. And the great desire of his heart was to see the second generation of pilgrims Second generation of Puritans preserve and experience true faith in Jesus Christ. Imagine, normally you don't put together Puritan and backslider together, but we are only one generation. We're one generation from losing Christendom. Unless every generation has a radical, life-transforming encounter with Jesus Christ, we are one generation from extinction. Every generation must have that divine encounter. And he was known for his bombastic preaching. You don't normally think of Puritan preachers of knowing bomb, being bombastic, but he was. He pastored that church and he preached straightforward sermons, challenging the youth, Puritan youth, to come to faith in Jesus Christ. He was known for his sermons railing against the abuse of alcohol. He was known for his sermons where he depicted hell and fire and brimstone. He was known for calling people to surrender to Jesus Christ. When he died, his grandson became the pastor of this church. You know him by the name of Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards started pastoring this church, and what was his concern? That the fourth generation of Puritans would lose out with God. And indeed, in his day, they were backsliding. They were losing out with God. It had become so bad that the communities in New England found a theology to allow for the young people to participate. Most towns in New England, the center point, the focal point, is the church. The church is built, the community is built around the church. And all the social activities, all the political activities, all the town hall meetings took place in the church. Where do you think the Boston Tea Party started? In the church. Rebel rousers, those preachers were in those days. Well, Jonathan Edwards seeing what was going on and hearing this theology, it became known as the halfway covenant. You see, to participate in the life of the church, you had to be a member of the church. To participate in communion, you had to be a member of the church. But how do you allow somebody to become a member of the church if they've never repented of their sins, never received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Well, you come up with a theology like this. If your mother or your father was a believer, you were halfway there, Therefore, that's good enough to participate in communion, to participate in the life of the church, and to be a member of the church. You're halfway there. If your parents had baptized you, you're halfway there. You don't have to be a true believer, but as long as you're halfway there. Well, Jonathan Edwards, in the tradition of his grandfather, believed that every person needed to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior for himself or for herself, grandma's religion, grandpa's religion, mom's religion, dad's religion, sister's religion, brother's religion, aunt's and uncle's religion, not good enough for you. You must have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So he began to preach these sermons confronting the young people, the youth of his day, and revival broke out. His most famous sermon was Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, in which he preached a pretty straightforward message. You hang by a slender thread over the leaping flames of hell, and at any moment the bow of God which is drawn can be let the arrow fly to sever that thread, and you would plummet for all eternity into a devil's hell. Ooh. 
That's not politically correct. How many of you had to read it in, when you took American literature? Yeah, I did too. I had a teacher ask me if I would memorize it and preach it the way Jonathan Edwards preached it. And I said, I don't know that I can do that. She thought he must have frothed at the mouth, but then you go back and read the literature about Jonathan Edwards. He had to wear spectacles. He read from a manuscript, and he had an Abraham Lincoln high-pitched voice. So instead of being the base bombastic preacher that I think he must have been, you hang by a slender thread over the leaping flames of hell. It was more Mickey Mouse. You hang by a slender thread over the leaping flames of hell. So it was the sheer weight of God's word that caused people to repent. In fact, as he preached these descriptive sermons, people reached out and grabbed the upright beams, the support beams of the buildings that they were in for fear that they might slide into hell. And revival broke out and swept through New England. It's what we know as the first great awakening. Church after church after church began to experience genuine revival. And I would say this to any generation. I don't care who your grandmother was, who your grandfather was. I don't care what Pentecostal office your father held or your mother holds. Unless you personally repent of your sins and turn to Jesus Christ as your only hope of salvation, you too will perish in a lake of fire that was prepared for the devil and fallen angels. The only hope for any society is to turn to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Can I get an amen? Well, in the wake of that revival known as the First Great Awakening, came the American Revolution, where the tyranny of England at the time became so oppressive that the colonists here in what we know as the United States chafed under it, began to try to throw off the chains of bondage, if you will, to King George. And in 1775, I flew through Philadelphia yesterday. That was an experience in the wake of the Democratic Convention. I won't say anything else. We'll just leave it there. Oh, I will add this. There were cardboard cutouts of Hillary everywhere and bobblehead Hillary's everywhere and pink T-shirts of Hillary everywhere. I just snapped photos. I didn't buy any of them. But in Philadelphia, to the Assembled Continental Congress, George Washington, I told you this a year ago, he approached them and asked them to fund a navy. His reasoning was this. If we're ever going to defeat the British, we've got to keep their ships offshore. We've got to keep them out of the harbors because if they come into the harbors, they'll bring supplies and troops and we'll never be able to beat, defeat them here on land. And Congress, in its pooled wisdom, said no. So George Washington went out and funded what became known as Washington's private navy. He purchased six schooners, equipped as best as he could with cannons, these little ships, and each one of the ships sailed underneath this flag. And I shared this part with you last year. It was a white flag with a green pine tree and a phrase drawn from the writings of John Locke, which is an appeal to heaven. Did we lose it? Did it disappear? There it is. That's the wrong picture, but we'll go with that one. There it is. 1775. Well, I started doing some research on this flag after I shared with you last, last year, and I, trying to learn more about it. Found that there's some amazing stories. These little ships sailing under this flag. And the, fra the phrase, an appeal to heaven, drawn from John Lyke's writings, where he's referring to natural law. There are certain laws that supersede the laws of man, and those are the laws of God. And he's indicating in his writings, when you appeal to the sovereign, to the king, and cannot receive righteousness or justice, there's a higher authority than the king. When you appeal to parliament, when you appeal to Congress, Congress may think they're the final word, but they're not. There's a higher authority than the Congress or parliament, and that's Almighty God. When you can't get justice from the Supreme Court, the Supremes may think they're the ultimate, but they are not. There's Almighty God. You can appeal to the court of heaven for justice and righteousness. So these little schooners are out sailing underneath this flag when one of them, named the Lee, encountered 
His Majesty's ship, the Nancy, a brigantine, a bigger ship. And the captain of the Nancy saw the, the Lee approach them flying under this, this flag, not recognizing the flag, thought this must be a pilot boat sent out to lead us into harbor. So they allowed the Lee to approach very close. And the captain of the Lee recognized that captain of the Nancy doesn't know what's going on. So he had all of his men disguise their uniforms, hide their weapons, approach the Nancy, and the captain of the Nancy allowed these continental sailors to board the ship without a shot being fired. And what they found was the Nancy was laden with cannons, cannonballs, gunpowder, muskets, and mini balls sufficient to equip the Continental Army for a year. And some people think this may have been the turning point of the war. As people with nowhere else to go appealed to Almighty God. And you know how the war turned out. We celebrated the Declaration of Independence and our independence just recently. But after the Revolutionary War, as we're moving into a new generation, so easy for them to forget the First Great Awakening, moral declension became commonplace. These colleges like Harvard University, Yale University, Williams College, that had been founded for the purposes of training ministers and missionaries, Princeton, who had Jonathan Edwards as its president, they began to turn their back on God. They became exceedingly liberal. In fact, many of the colleges had what were known as profane societies, where the students competed with each other to see how vulgar and profane they could be in speech. One of the colleges in Princeton, New Jersey, went to a Presbyterian church, took the Bible out of the church, and burned it to make a statement. Williams College in Williamstown, Massachusetts, the students held a mock communion to ridicule Christ and Christianity. That's how bad it got to be in the wake of the American Revolution. Imagine the apostasy that is taking place, the blasphemy that was occurring in the educational institutions. It had become so bad that bank robberies were almost a daily occurrence in the colonies at the time, uh, the new country at the time. Women were afraid to go outside, particularly at night, for fear they would be assaulted. That's how bad it had become. When Jonathan Edwards' grandson, Timothy Dwight, was selected to be the president of Yale University, as the new president, he went there, and they still had chapels, which is really strange when you consider nobody's a believer. They were still having chapels, so he decided to start preaching the gospel. Kind of a straightforward message. Uh, maybe you've heard it before. Repent of your sins, turn to Jesus Christ as your only hope of salvation, or you'll perish in a hell prepared for the devil and his fallen angels. He preached in chapel, and then in the evening, he engaged in debates and discussions with the students. And through the sheer weight of God's word, sounds familiar? Through the skillful reasoning skills of Timothy Dwight, revival broke out, and students on the Yale University campus began to surrender to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And it began to spread to other colleges, began to spread to other schools and other communities. Revival broke out, and this was the beginning of what became known as the Second Great Awakening, as it began spreading from college to college. Imagine this. In 1803, I think we have a picture, a deacon from First Church in Bradford, Massachusetts, and 30 farmers got together and decided to start a school. It was known as Bradford College or Bradford Academy that became Bradford College. And they started at this location. This building still exists in Bradford, Massachusetts. It was known as the Kimball Tavern. Don't think in terms of a uh, drinking place as much as a, a meeting place. And there they started Bradford College. After the school was running for a brief period of time, John Hazeltine, the deacon who had started, along with his daughter Abigail Hazeltine, they brought in a new teacher, a new teacher from the colleges that were experiencing revivals. And he came in with a new message. And the message was this. Students, if you don't repent of your sins and turn to Jesus Christ as your only hope of salvation, don't count on your mother's religion, don't count on your father's religion, don't count on your grandmother's religion or your grandfather's religion. You must have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And revival broke out at Bradford College, and 85% of the student body experienced a wonderful, life-transforming encounter with Christ. And revival spread, spread to First Church in Bradford, Massachusetts, where John Hazeltine, the deacon, served. 
While that was taking place, some dangerous literature began to be circulated among the college students. Extremely dangerous stuff. It spread all the way over to Williams College in Williamstown, Massachusetts. And this dangerous literature was written by William Carey, British missionary to India, father of modern missions in some people's description. And here was the really dangerous literature. When Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples, he was serious. And you're thinking, well, what's so dangerous about that? At that time, the congregational churches taught that if God wanted to evangelize the heathen, he would evangelize the heathen. It was none of our business. Our responsibility is our community and compassion ministries. It is not our responsibility to evangelize the nations of the world. That's God's responsibility. So this began to circulate among the college students. And as the students were reading this literature, some of the students at Williams College in Williamstown, Massachusetts, got together and said, let's pray about this strange idea that we're reading about going into all the world and evangelizing. They got together in August to pray. And as they were praying, in 1806, a rainstorm came up, and they hid on the leeward side of a haystack and continued their prayer meeting. It became known as the haystack prayer meeting. From those five, one became an, an attorney, the others became ministers or missionaries. One of them became the head of the American Bible Society to put Bibles in the hands of ministers and eventually missionaries are going to the world, nations of the world. But keep in mind, no missionary had left the United States yet to go to the nations of the world. None. From the Williams Haystack prayer meeting, the students went to a new seminary that had been founded by Timothy Dwight in Andover, Massachusetts. Are you still with me? It turns into a love story here in a second, okay? As they were, this, Andover had been founded because Harvard had drifted to the point of universalism, Unitarianism, and turned its back on God. So they started this new seminary in Andover for college students to come and prepare for ministry. And the seminary students, having read this literature by William Carey, in 1810, came to what we would call a district council or a, uh, what do we call it, ministry network meeting now. They came to a meeting that was being held at First Church in 1810. One of them had been at the Haystack prayer meeting. And as they came to First Church, they approached the assembled ministers there and said, would you do something radical for us? Send us to the nations of the world. Uh, the, that would be the picture, I think, of the monument as well. Today, there's a monument in front of First Church in the Bradford Common with a brass plaque on it dedicated to the missions organization that was founded there in Bradford, Massachusetts, across the street from Kimball Tavern where Bradford College was founded, in front of First Church. The ministers there said, it's a good idea. We think maybe God's serious about this. We'll send you to the nations of the world. At that meeting was John Hazeltine. John Hazeltine was the deacon at First Church. And at the end of the day, he invited these seminary students, five of them, to come to his house for dinner. Well, at dinner, John Hazeltine's daughter, Anne Hazeltine, who was a student at Bradford College, and her friend Harriet Atwood, well, you know how this works, don't you? Young unmarried seminary students, young unmarried female college students seated at the table. Sparks must have erupted. Love developed. Two years later, Anne Hazeltine Judson, incidentally, I can look out my office window to see the house from 1789 where Anne Hazeltine was born. She fell in love with Adoniram Judson. Anybody hear that name before, Adoniram Judson? You've heard of Judson College, Judson Press. And Harriet Atwood fell in love with Samuel Newell. Two years later, Adoniram Judson married Anne Hazeltine. Samuel Newell married Harriet Atwood. 
And for a honeymoon, not recommended, but for a honeymoon, they left Bradford, Massachusetts, went to Salem, Massachusetts, boarded a ship, and sailed to India as the very first missionaries from the United States to the world. Thank God that somebody responded to the clear teachings of the Scripture. Go into all the world. That's pretty simple. Go and do it. Well, on their way over, studying the Scriptures, Adoniram Judson determined that maybe a baptism should be by immersion. It should be believer's baptism and not infant sprinkling. So when he arrived, he went to William Carey and asked to be baptized by immersion, and he lost all of his funding from the missions board, ended up becoming a missionary to Burma. They wouldn't let him stay in India. So he went to Burma, translated the scriptures into the Burmese language, served time in prison. His wife wrote his journals, sent them back to the States, and that's how we know everything about Adoniram Judson. Two years ago, two busloads of people pulled up in front of First Church, went out to this monument, or that monument was up there a minute ago, and posed for photographs because they said, we trace our Christianity to this location, to this event. It's an amazing thing to see. So, one of the early graduates of Bradford College became the first female missionary to Hawaii. How cool is that? From Bradford, Massachusetts, the first of the missionaries to Hawaii. Hazel married Asa Thurston, and that church that they founded is still in existence in Hawaii. If you go to Hawaii, you can visit this church built with natural stone in Hawaii. But the missionary left from Bradford College, Bradford, Massachusetts, to go to Hawaii. How cool is that? In his 197th year, Bradford College closed. It had shifted from its original purpose. Remember, we're only generation, one generation away from losing our moorings and our ties to Christianity. Lost its purpose. It was no longer training ministers and missionaries. It was training fine arts. Uh, marijuana was being grown on the campus. It was so bad. I mean, it was growing in the irrigation ditches on the campus. Partying taking place among the faculty and the students. Without saying anything more, they lost their international students they lost some of their financial backers. Their debt rose. They sold off as many assets as they possibly could. They couldn't keep their doors open. And in the year 2000, Bradford College closed. A beautiful Ivy League school sat empty. 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 The school from which some of the very first missionaries to the nations of the world came sat empty. One year two years. And while it was sitting empty, vandals got into it. They smashed windows out of the buildings. A group of occultists, Satanists, got down into the pedestrian tunnels and spray-painted graffiti, satanic graffiti, and slogans and images all over the walls. They got down into that. The, the weeds grew up around the campus. Rumors spread, and sure enough, if you look up Bradford College today, it was listed as one of the top ten most haunted campuses in the United States. I don't know if it was or not, but that's what the people thought. In the year 2002, a group of Christians became so grieved over this campus sitting idle, neglected, they began to walk the campus and pray. They brought me this photo, photo album, and I just took two of the photos out of their album. This is groups of these Christians. And they're not just Assemblies of God people. These are from across the country. Different people just come and walk the campus and pray. God, restore this piece of property to its original purpose. God, restore the mission of this college. God, perform a miracle. Perform a miracle. Perform a miracle. Nobody had the money for this. God, perform a miracle. They walked the campus 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006, consistently praying. They asked a real estate agent to let them go into the buildings. They went into the buildings and anointed the furniture and the equipment with oil, praying over it, claiming it for the kingdom of God. Praying for a miracle. Praying for a miracle. Now let me just stop and tell you, Zion Bible College, 
was located in Barrington, Rhode Island. Some of you recall that there was a fire that took place in Rhode Island, a nightclub fire, 100 people died, the doors were chained locked, the pyrotechnics of the rock band went off and set the building up ablaze, people couldn't escape. In the aftermath of that, the Rhode Island legislature passed laws that were so prescriptive and so restrictive that if you had a public building and you wanted to do any repairs to it, you had to retrofit everything. Had to retrofit everything for fire safety. New fire escapes, new fire equipment, fire suppression systems. Well, Zion at the time was struggling for survival financially. They didn't know what they were going to do. They had leaking buildings. They couldn't repair their roofs. And the reason they couldn't repair their roofs is they would have to retrofit their buildings to the tune of $11 million. They just didn't have the money. They were having a hard time meeting payroll. They were praying, praying for a miracle, asking God for a miracle. They heard about this college and offered, went to banks to see if somebody would loan them money, and nobody would loan them any money. So they just kept praying, we need a miracle, we need a miracle, we need a miracle. At Zion in Rhode Island. When in the year 2007, the owners of Hobby Lobby purchased Barrington College, renovated it, put in fire suppression system, carpet, windows, upgraded everything, and in 2007, they donated it to Zion Bible College, debt free. That's an $18 million miracle, folks. $18 million. Now, my attorney says it's worth more than $18 million because it also involved paying off the debt in Rhode Island. So he keeps saying it's not $18 million, it's a $21 million miracle. $21 million miracle. And that's my office. North Point Bible College, Academy Hall. That's just one of the buildings on the campus. Renovated, upgraded, a miracle. Answer to prayer for faithful people. Now, being out of debt sounded really good when I was elected the president. I almost did the Snoopy dance of joy. You know, I'm the new president of a college that has no debt. Woo-hoo! But you've got to maintain that. And you've got to pay your bills. Last year I told you how I got down and prayed, sought God. God heard, answered, and provided for us. In the wake of that intense time of prayer, the people who had walked the campus and prayed came to visit me and said, we have a gift for you. And every time you face a challenge, remember, you walk on a miraculous campus provided by Almighty God in response to prayer. And every time you're up against it and don't know what to do, appeal to heaven. And they gave me this gift. They gave me that flag. And then they said, go look it up. Look up the story behind the flag. And remember that when you're up against it, the devil doesn't have the final word. Almighty God does. When you don't know where to turn, turn and appeal to heaven, and God will intervene for you. And uh, trust me, Every time I see that flag, that's what I think of. I work at a place where God has voted for us. He's provided supernaturally for us. Today, North Point Bible College has no debt. Still no debt. After eight years, no debt. No long-term debt, no short-term debt. God has continued to provide. And I'm happy to report that this summer, with donor support, we're putting in $1 million of upgrades to the campus. No debt. We only do one thing. Train ministers and missionaries for the kingdom of God. Pentecostal ministers and missionaries. Unashamed Pentecostal ministers and missionaries. That's all we do. We now have a branch campus in Grand Rapids that runs 90. And we have approval from our accrediting body to establish a branch campus in... Louisville. What, what's the name of the campground? There. It's where we want to plant it. And we just received approval to establish a branch campus, a satellite campus in Los Angeles, the West Coast. 
God's not done equipping ministers and missionaries. Young people who respond to the call of God, God will find a way. He will move heaven and hell to equip them to go and change their generation. And I'm pleased to be a part of what God is doing. I consider myself experiencing a miracle. And interestingly enough, we have one building that we can't use, and our chapel is maxed out. We just remodeled the chapel to squeeze as many as we can into our chapel. But this last year, I decided, let's just start praying for a miracle. And I put a, we had a design put together of a matching building that would go on our campus. And the people who prayed for those years have come back to the campus And they're walking around the building that needs to come down and they're praying that God would replace the old building with a new building. It would be a state-of-the-art ministry, arts, building, and chapel. And they're beginning to walk around the building. Now, I can't guarantee that there's a correlation here, but this last winter, bricks started falling off of that old building. Not sure there's a direct relationship, but I certainly wouldn't put it out of mind. So, last fall, we had a missions emphasis on campus. And I said to the students, you are now in the location from which the very first missionaries to the world, the very first missionaries to Hawaii were launched from this location. Would you walk a block up the street, stand in front of that monument and have your photo taken and tag it, we are North Point and put it on Facebook. And boy, they did. They started popping up all over and I was looking at one of the photographs and it hit me who this student was. Do we have a picture of the students standing next to the monument? While we were looking at the pictures, the one closest to the monument on the left side, the gentleman. Left side? Well, my left, your right. He had his hand like this. And I said to my wife, what's that all about? And she said, don't you know, that's the Hawaiian kind of hang 10 for surfing. It's a surfing thing. And I said, oh, I know him. Ian, he's from Hawaii. We've had 20 students from Hawaii. Why would you leave Hawaii? Why would you leave Hawaii and come to Boston to prepare for the ministry? But we've had 20 students from Hawaii preparing for the ministry the last couple of years, and we have more students from Hawaii coming. So I asked Ian, and I asked the other students from Hawaii, do you know the story of the first missionaries from the United States to Hawaii? And I know Hawaii's in the United States, but at the time it wasn't. I said, why would you do that? And they said, we don't know. We don't know the story. And I said, God does. God's got an interesting sense of humor. It's gone full circle. From whence the first missionaries were sent, now they're coming back and preparing and going back. Ian graduated in December, and now he's ministering in Hawaii today. And I know I'm not pronouncing Hawaii correctly. They would fix they try to fix it for me, but I can't do it. So I want you to know our God is an amazing God. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what your challenge is. But when you're up against it, whether it be a doctor's report that was negative, a financial report, challenges that you're dealing with, I don't know what you're dealing with, but God does. And I tell you, the doctor's word is not the final word. Your creditor's word is not the final word. There is a God in heaven waiting for you to appeal to him. He is the final authority. Miracles still happen. Signs and wonders are available to God's people. And pastor, would you come? I have a gift for you. Whenever you see this, I want you to remember that God still performs modern day miracles because I feel like I'm walking in a modern day miracle every time I walk on the campus. And I want you to experience the same thing, especially as we move into the fall with a satellite campus right here in your backyard. So I have a gift for you. So I don't know where you're going to put it, but put it in your prayer room. Put it in the youth room. Maybe you're here today and you've never repented of your sins and surrendered to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And I would tell you very bluntly, very plainly, what Solomon's daughter told the people of his day, what Jonathan Edwards told the people of his day, what Timothy Dwight told the people of his day, your mother's religion, your father's religion, your grandmother, your grandfather, your aunts and your uncles, your sister, your brother, it's not good enough. You must repent of your sins, turn to Jesus Christ as your only hope of salvation. He will save you, 
deliver you, set your feet upon a solid rock, and you know what your destiny would be. It will not be a lake of fire prepared for the devil and the fallen angels. Instead, you'll begin to walk in abundant life and move into eternal life with the Savior who died on the cross for you. That's my challenge to you. If you need a miracle today, just right now, appeal to heaven. Why don't you stand to your feet? Let's pray for a miracle. Let's pray for supernatural provision. I don't know what your church is facing. I don't know what you as an individual are facing. I don't know what the district is facing. facing. I don't know what our nation is facing. I just know what pieces I run into. But I know a God who provides miracles. I'm walking in it on a daily basis. Father, we appeal to you today. The Almighty God, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus who's given us access to come boldly before the throne of grace to present our petitions and our needs. Lord, we need to experience your supernatural, miraculous power. Thank you, Lord, for the ability to share a testimony of how you have provided. But we know it's not just for us. You're no respecter of persons. What you've done for one, you'll do for another. Lord, supply, supply, supply. May signs, wonders, and the miraculous be evident in this church, in this community, in this state, in this district, in this nation, in our world. Grant it, we pray, in the name of Jesus.